I dagens sparpodden blir det olja- och gasaktier för hela slanten. En sektor som kanske inte varit allas favorit, men som är superintressant. Och för att krydda det här avsnittet så har vi med oss en superintressant gäst hela vägen från Houston, USA. Han förvaltar en fond mycket framgångsrik inom den här sektorn. Och nu är han här. Jag säger warm welcome to sparpodden, Josh Young. Thank you for having me on. Uh, you're sitting in Houston. You are investing in oil and gas companies. Uh, I assume mainly in North America. Tell us about yourself because I think almost everyone of our Swedish viewers uh, haven't heard about you before. Sure. Yeah. So um, I'm the portfolio manager for Bison Interests. Uh, Bison invests for clients in the oil and gas public equity space. And we were launched in 2015, and we've done pretty well since we launched, which is amazing because the sector has done very poorly. And you know, we we have a, a global focus, so we look everywhere. But currently, most of our investments in oil and gas public equities are in North America, and we can get into sort of why that is. And um, you know, I saw in your announcement on social media around this interview a number of different questions about different geographies and sort of what's happening in the world of oil and gas. Um, and so happy to happy to to jump into that too. Yes, because you're touching on uh, that we always ask our viewers for questions and they keep piling in. Uh, I've collected some, and basically um, we can let's start with what's happening with the oil right now so we see some trouble in the middle east it's it sounds like a running theme trouble in the middle east it, it's been going on for a while but it does affect at least in the short term the oil price uh, we've had renewed tensions in the middle east to say the least uh, do we see any reaction on the oil price and the oil companies yes yeah, so so i think the right way to think about it is that there's been this concern, frankly, for my entire professional investment career. So I started investing in public equities in 2007 professionally. And at that time, people were worried about Israel <laughs> bombing Iran and that affecting the price of oil. It was one of the uh, causes of the super spike in oil prices in 2008, where oil prices went to close to $150 a barrel US, which on an inflation adjusted basis is close to $250 a barrel in today's dollars. Um, so th that's always been sort of on the back burner. And I think it's worth remembering that that happened because what we've seen so far for the last you know 15 plus years is there are these sorts of concerns and then the market sells them down when they don't actually play out. So there's a little bit of risk built in into the price and then uh, a sell-off. And that's been sort of the habitual market behavior, we've sort of been, it's almost Pavlovian, we've been trained to do that. But there is a reality, which is that in the 1970s, there were two oil supply disruptions that were real, that sent oil prices up. The first one sent oil up almost 5x, and the second one sent oil up 2 to 3x. And there was material and um, you know persistent, and it led to a dramatic revaluation of oil and gas equities. And so I think the thing to keep in mind is, that most of this stuff is noise and it mostly doesn't matter. And frankly, I would argue a lot of the day to day and even month to month price movements of oil and of related equities are, are no noise opportunities to sell if you're ready to sell something or buy if you're ready to buy something, depending on where you're at in that little price volatility cycle. Um, but I think there is this risk. And I think the risk is to the right tail where at some point, there may be a supply disruption like we saw in the 1970s. And to the extent that happens, that would be you know, sort of a reason to own, similar to semiconductors, uh, where you, know, you couldn't have known that AI would have taken off as much as it did, but if you owned NVIDIA for X, Y, Z other reasons, and then it takes off, you have this sort of extra five or 10X or something. So I think there's a similar sort of potential in oil and gas that uh, and if we, if we look at the supply uh, part, um, supply disruption, when I was little, there was this uh, thing we were taught in school about peak oil, that someday the oil production, the supply is going to be less than the demand. 
and it's just not going to physically, it's not going to be able to exist enough oil for the day-to-day -day demand. Uh, that never really materialized. And then you had in uh, more recent years with the shale oil and the fracking in the US where you thought that US would no longer be thinking about what's happening in the Middle East because they've sourced their own supply and so on. And yet again, it's still being affected by the Middle East what's happening in the US supply? Uh, haven't they figured this out already? Why are we still talking about the Middle East so much? Yeah, so um, on the, the peak oil thing, I think we will eventually hit peak oil supply. But what we've seen, I think, is more peak cheap oil, where we've produced most of the readily available oil at $10 a barrel, and then $20 a barrel, and then 30 and we're sort of moving up where there's sort of a, a floor. And the re that's actually tied directly to U.S. supply, where we had dropped the cost of supply temporarily through improvements in technology, as well as operational efficiency um, in addressing unconventional rock, uh, people call it shale, but also limestone, various other formations um, in the U.S. and then now Canada and various other places. And what we're seeing is that that has played out to some extent too. And so with oil prices falling last year, they didn't have to fall to 40 or 30 to get a supply disruption. Even going below 70 a few times last year was enough for the rig count to fall. And now we're actually seeing US oil production down relative to the start of the year and relative to the peak last year. And so absent a significant increase in drilling rigs, or some sort of new innovation and new improvement that we're not seeing evidence of, but there's always that possibility. Um, U.S. production may decline more, and we may see much higher oil prices anyway, just because, um, you know, sort of when the floor is raised for something, it raises the ceiling typically as well. But let's say you invest in a company in the U.S., uh, shale oil, its production cost is like $60 or say, $65. And then the price of the the oil price drops close to break even or below that. Does it make sense for them to shut down operation totally? Or is there not a case where they'll still produce anyway? Because it's just like you can't just turn it on and off and offset the cost. It's going to be more costly to shut down operation than produce for a small uh, loss. Yeah, so I think I think there's some complexity there that I think is often I think the question you're raising is is often sort of raised um, by newspapers and and on TV, and I think I think there's complexity there that's worth addressing. So um, when you know there's there's different aspects of a of an oil producer's operations. There's the drilling aspect, which is to bring on incremental supply and to replace the depletion of existing wells. Uh, a shale well might come on at 1,000 barrels a day in the first month, but might be at 300 barrels a day by the end of the first year, and at 100 barrels a day by the end of, let's say, year five. And so you need to, if you're a shale producer, you need to drill pretty consistently in order to sustain your production for yet growing it um, ju just because of that natural decline rate that's particularly high with shale wells. So there's a lot that producers can do to sort of modulate their production, either higher or, or lower, um, depending on the price they're seeing as well as their expectation of future price. And I think what happened was with oil prices falling last year and going from an expectation in, let's say, 2022 of persistently high prices to increasingly late in 23 and then into 2024 of volatile and potentially lower prices, uh, the impetus to invest has um, diminished. So basically, the producers are going to want to drill a little less and spend a little less because they're less certain about the high price that they would get for their product. So if a producer was producing, let's say, 100,000 barrels a day, they might allow their production to decline to 98,000, or they might allow it to grow to 102,000 versus previously, maybe they would have gone for 105. And the reason all this matters so much, even though the US, again, is not 
you know, it's the world's largest oil producer, but if you look at the 13 or so million barrels a day, or even the 20 million of total liquids the U.S. is producing, it's small relative to the global supply of over 100 million barrels a day. Um, it matters because that number is up enormously from where it was when I started my career. In 2007, I think the U.S. was producing, what, three or four million barrels a day, somewhere in there, maybe another million or two million barrels a day of liquids, but a fraction of what it's producing now. The U.S. has been the largest incremental producer of oil and natural gas liquids um, by far. And so that slowdown really matters. And it's having an effect on the global uh, price as well as the risk of, uh, you know, we were in an energy crisis until recently in Europe and, and Asia, various other places. And there is that risk that I think is, um, I think, when you're when you're looking at that rate of change and you're looking at the sources of incremental supply, I think that risk increases when you have the largest grower stop growing and actually start to shrink. Uh, and when speaking about companies, we have uh, received a lot of uh, questions to you. Uh, let's try one of the viewers' questions. Uh, Torbjörn, he asks. Uh, how does Josh choose his oil company he invests in? Uh, do, do you find any geographies with extra good risk return uh, right now for oil? So uh, let's start with the second part, uh, geographies, and then to how do you pick your companies? Yeah, so I think, I think there's um, geopolitical risk. Uh, there, there's risk of uh, tax increases or expropriation by governments or ability to bring oil to market, frankly, in almost every country in the world right now. And so um, you know, there's different countries where there's more of a history of protection of private property. And there's other countries where there's been a history of expropriation. And then there's uh, among those, there's leaders that are saying they're going to try to expropriate oil production um, or to increase taxes. And there's leaders that are saying the opposite. So um, you know, I think the, the landscape right now from a risk perspective is really complex. And so when you look at the valuations, I think that helps along with the history of private property rights. And what I found is that even though um, certain geographies have historically been very discounted, um, in many cases, and this is part of why for most of Bison's history, we've been focused on North America, you can actually find smaller oil and gas producers in the US and Canada that are trading at a discount on reserve value, and in some cases on cash flow versus companies in XYZ, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa or, uh, you know, socialist uh, South American country or Asian country with a history of disruption or uh, expropriation. So um, for the most part, we're exposed either in North America or offshore where there's a little less um, geopolitical risk. There's a couple of specific um, jurisdictions that we have some exposure in onshore outside of North America. Um, but I think I think the right way to approach investing is uh, in in public equities is to not treat the stocks like um, like electronic blips on a screen that go up and down and so on. But to think about them, you know, I have this picture <laughs> of Warren Buffett for the snowball. You think about think about these businesses. This isn't my unique thought, but when you think about them as individual entities with managers and employees and assets that are very unique because each of them, even these shale companies, they might look really similar, but the people are different and the capital structures are different and the specific wells they're in have their own characteristics. And so by underwriting each company as its own sort of mini world and treating each potential investment as a special situation, We've been able to, we don't always avoid blowups. We've had problems like, like anyone from an investment perspective in a down cycle, in a sector, in a down cycle sector. Um, but we've been able to avoid a lot of problems and then also find things when, when you're not looking for something, you're not going to find it. And so 
by looking for extraordinary value. We've been able to find really compelling value in places that are relatively safe. Stanna, stanna, stanna. Vill du investera i grejer som till exempel råvaror men inte känner för att köpa en stor dunk olja eller en guldtacka eller kanske en stor bit koppar? Då kan du istället investera i trackers via Nordic Markets. Det funkar så här med en tracker. Den trackar, alltså följer, det underliggande. Är det en guldtracker, då följer den guldpriset ungefär 1 till 1. Går guldpriset upp 1% i svenska kronor, så ska den här trackern gå upp ungefär 1% den också. Och är det så att du köper Nordic Markets produkter via Nordnet så får du vi köp över 1000 kronor gratis kortage. Det man ska tänka på är att det finns en spread. Den kommer du se hur mycket den är. Och dessutom så är det en liten avgift som dras på detta. Kom ihåg att investeringar är med risk. Historisk avkastning är ingen garanterad avkastning i framtiden. Nu tillbaks till podden. And that leads me to this segment which I will call Josh's top three investment right now within oil and gas. Uh, so before this show, we I asked you to at least have uh, three picks, and we'll go through them one on one, and we'll delve into each one of them. So let's start with your number three. Um, okay, so I haven't talked about this before publicly, so this will be fun, um, and it's actually different than what we normally do at Bison, where we are focused on small cap oil and gas producers. Um, this is a company that is integrated and large, at least by uh, its local jurisdiction standards. It's a company called Synovus Energy, and we have exposure through related securities. Um, you know, they have listed warrants and other sorts of things as a big company that's done a historic merger and so on. And it's not our largest position, but it's a little unusual. And what happened is that. Synovus merged with Husky a number of years ago um, in, in the middle of sort of the COVID uh, downturn. And they inherited this set of refiners that Husky um, owned that were underperforming. They were sort of the, the highest cost, lowest quality refiners. And what Synovus has done is improve a lot of them. I believe they shut one or two of them down, or at least parts of them down, and they're they're rapidly transforming them into, um, let's say, average refiners. And actually, for most of our history at Bison, we haven't really invested in refiners, but we look at these things all really carefully, and we like to buy stocks at a discount to their competitors, at a discount to our estimate of liquidation value, and a discount to our estimate of replacement cost. And replacement cost is really hard for refiners because you can't build a new refiner in North America, at least in <laughs> maybe in Mexico, but you can't build one in, why, why in can't the US you build, or Canada. Wait, wait, why, why can't you build a refiner? Um, it would take an enormous uh, amount of upfront capital and many years and you wouldn't be able to have, I mean, I guess technically you could, but um, the red tape associated with it and the, um, the uh, essentially you can't build one. So it's not like there's a law that says no more refiners, but there haven't built, been new refineries built in a very long time in North America. And um, the new ones that are being built are essentially taking existing small refineries and getting rid of them and replacing them with biodiesel or other sorts of um, sort of new new energy fuel. Uh, so, so that's actually so that's been reducing refinery supply. Um, and then on the demand side, it, it's been interesting because there were new refiners built internationally that were always sort of the risk to refining. And then um, those projects are mostly done at this point. But global oil demand keeps rising by about a million and a half to two million barrels a day every year. And so we were in a situation where there was a global oversupply of refining and new builds coming on. And now we're in a situation where increasingly there may be a refining shortage. And again, this is I know it sounds very strange uh, coming from me where I've, I've been pretty bearish on refining and pretty bearish 
And, and I think like the reality is that when the situation changes and the facts change, it's important to be able to look at something. And we were always underwriting the refiners and always looking closely at sort of what was happening because it's such an important part of the value chain uh, for oil and gas. Uh, but just to like go back to the stock, so it has a refinery business uh, aside from, I assume, shale oil or what do they produce uh, themselves apart from that? They have oil sands. Um, and so that's where I was getting to. They, If you look at their production, uh, their upstream production, you basically can pay roughly in line with their peers for their production and get this refining business essentially for free, there was a point where we were getting into this position where you actually were getting paid to take their refineries essentially through the valuation of the stock uh, because people hated it so much. And that was why I focused on that aspect. I mean, they have a huge upstream business. They also have some natural gas production. They have a large asset in the deep basin sort of across the liquids rich gas portion of uh, Alberta. And you know, I'm not a huge fan of oil sands in Canada because I think they're at target from additional taxes and regulations by Canada. But if I can get the oil sands at a discount and then get refining, um, an asset that people view very negatively in a sector that sort of struggled to get attention essentially for free or get paid to take it, and then get the giant natural gas exposure and the integration and the infrastructure and all of that essentially for free, it's pretty exciting. And so, you know, it's not as cheap as some of the smallest companies that we're invested in. And it's not as cheap, I would argue, as the other couple of companies we're going to talk about. But it's sort of for being the size that it is, it's very cheap. And it also has this exposure to these refineries that are going from sort of worst in class that are still operating in the geographies they're in to sort of closer to average and in a couple of cases actually pretty good. And then the infrastructure they own connecting their oil to their refineries, they own some of the sort of gathering systems and some various other upgraders. Um, that's actually very valuable too, and they don't seem to get any valuation credit for it. And, and, and the uh, weirdest so, thing is just, they actually trade at a discount to some producers in their area that just have oil sands and have no infrastructure, no refining, and no natural gas, which is you know heavily discounted. But Josh, you've been speaking about valuation and discount. Give us like uh, a picture of the numbers, price earning, cash flow, free cash flow. Uh, where are we there? Uh, had they depth? Yeah, so um, I, think, I think there is, it's not quite, again, as cheap as some of the smallest cap uh, producers, but they're at about a turn or turn and a half cheaper than their competitors on just operating cash flow. So they're trading at, it looks like sort of, and it's it's a little tough because the the numbers are moving so fast. And, and I know that sounds sort of funny from like a financial world because everyone always has their like, ah, oh, this thing is at this price based on whatever, but they their cash flow is driven by refining margins, which are moving a lot, but are actually pretty high. Um, and then uh, heavy oil differentials because they're selling um, oil sands, which is usually heavily discounted, but that oil value is rising. And then uh, the US dollar versus the Canadian dollar, where the Canadian dollar has been falling. So they're actually a disproportionate beneficiary because their costs are in Canadian dollars, but their revenue is in US dollars. Um, and then there's probably one or two other variables that I'm not really, but okay, let's say at four times run rate operating cash flow. And you know, they're pretty, their their free cash flow conversion is pretty good. They're at a high teens free cash flow yield. And it looks like as this refining thesis plays out and as the heavy oil thesis plays out, they could get closer to a 25% free cash flow yield. For, for a company that's producing, was it 700 something thousand barrels a day of production and has, um, last I checked, it was like a 30 million, sorry, $30 billion market cap. I mean, it's pretty, um, pretty significant in terms of that disconnect versus very similar companies. And then they have these other aspects that are essentially free, those numbers, again, get much better to the extent the Canadian dollar falls more, oil prices rise, um, refining margins um, stay strong or expand, um, or their transformation actually plays out. So I, I like that there's a lot of these things that are working, and then that it's 
relatively cheap. And then on a replacement cost basis, again, it's sort of hard to estimate because there haven't really been refineries that have been built in North America. But where the refineries are, it would be virtually impossible to build a new one. You wouldn't be able to get the regulatory approvals there. Um, they have some stuff on, on lakes and other places that are sort of considered very environmentally sensitive. Um, you know, if you try to figure out their extra margin from being in those places, the replacement cost would come in somewhere in the two or three times where they're trading for those assets. And again, you get oh. those assets sort of for free. All right. So your uh, that's one of your bullish stocks. Uh, let's go to Josh's number two. Um, okay. So so this one this one will make <laughs> make a little more sense to you. Maybe uh, it's a vital energy. Um, they're they're a, a shale producer here in the U.S. Um, they used to be called um, Laredo, and uh, with new management, um, the management changed in 2019. Um, they uh, they chose after a few years of this new strategy to change their name to Vital Energy. Um, they produce around 120,000 barrels a day of oil and natural gas and natural gas liquids, and they trade at a huge discount to their peers, partly because people don't seem to understand their strategy. And it's weird because it's such a simple strategy. They identified that shale inventory was running out. And so they wanted to buy more drilling inventory that broke even at the lowest price possible. And they were willing to do deals that were mostly accretive, but even a couple of deals that were considered dilutive on near-term cash flow in order to get as much of that inventory as possible. And that's already playing out in the sense that they they paid, let's say, two and a half times to three times cash flow for assets with inventory of, let's say, five to seven years. And they've discovered another roughly five years of inventory on the assets that they've been buying. So they're an active acquirer, which is sort of out of favor in the market. And they're a smaller producer, although less small than they've been, um, which is also out of favor. And their historic assets weren't as good. So they were considered to be a capital inefficient uh, producer or a higher cost producer because their legacy assets uh, prior to this management team coming in um, you would spend the same amount of money, but you'd get half as much oil and more natural gas, which is lower value. And so I think the the interesting thing about it is there are transactions all the time. So this one, it's easy in terms of replacement cost, liquidation value. There's transactions all the time around their assets where companies are being bought for five or six or seven times cash flow. And Vital is trading under three times cash flow right now. And so they're at a big discount on cash flow. They're at a big discount relative to reserve value, where you look at the transactions and they're typically at a premium to proved reserve value. And Vital trades at a large discount to its proved reserve value. But wait, and then, Josh, did you say they're trading at three times cash flow? Yeah, three times operating cash flow. Three times, but. Uh, and and how much are they trading on their free cash flow, more or less? Yeah, they're they're trading at about five times their free cash flow. Again, it's uh, five it, times. It, it, it may be a little uh, cheaper even than that. Maybe four, four and a half times. But um, giving the it's a question of do you give the spot price for natural gas or do you give the forward curve? Do you give them credit for their hedges on their gas or not? Do you punish them for their short term oil price hedges? Again, there's sort of people use these sort of very uh, concrete numbers for companies when the reality is, again, they're, they're organisms, right? They're their own thing, they're their own world. And there's a lot of different variables that can drive higher or lower. But yeah, on, con on a consensus basis, they're actually even cheaper than that. I think the forward on them is sort of two and a half times EBITDA, which is, you know, again, it's net of certain things and, uh, you know, adds back other things. Um, so the the most interesting thing about that, though, there are many of the recent transactions in the area that have been larger have been at five or six or seven times cash flow. And so and, and the assets, people criticize their assets, but it's actually this very interesting phenomenon because they came in as the replacement for a prior team that overpromised and underdelivered. Vital 
almost always. So I think for nine out of the last 10 quarters, they guided to a certain number and then they beat it by three to 5% over and over again. And then they guide to a certain amount of drilling inventory. And then magically they show up with more inventory over and over again. And again, it's not magic. It's that they're being careful about what they're buying and careful about what they're drilling. And so there's this weird perception of them being a high cost producer with limited inventory uh, and low value assets. And the reality is through their transformation over the last roughly five years, um, this team has taken them from a sort of lower value legacy position um, and built an enormous asset at a cost that if you tried to buy those assets today, you'd have to pay somewhere between two and four times what Vital paid to buy those same assets that Vital bought. And so, again, it's very hard for the market to appreciate these things. There's no buyback in place. There's no dividend. It's just a very cheap stock where the net asset value per share has been rising significantly. And there's many acquirers in the area that keep trying to buy stuff and there's a limited number of assets to buy. Uh, But I know you said it's some investors, maybe like me, like to uh, simplify it while the reality is way more complicated. But I'm still going to do it. So bear in mind this. Um, If it's trading at, say, four and a half, five times free cash flow and so on, essentially, they just need to not perform worse and survive for a couple of years for me to get my money back and still have my shares. Is this like, are they more cheap than their competitors or is this like a trend generally in the oil and gas companies? Because, I mean, these numbers you won't find in the tech world, for example. Yeah, so so I think I think there are companies that have, I think that are sort of more comfortable to hold where their share price volatility is lower and where they have buybacks or dividends in place. Vital is interesting to me because of the large discount versus you know my estimate of intrinsic value, but also numerous recent transactions by buyers that are looking to buy more, not less. And so um, you know we got into this through conversations with friends who actually owned some assets that Vital now owns. Um, and people who used to manage those assets. um, So they know the assets very, very well. And we were able to diligence them in depth to to get comfortable with the the quality of the assets as well as the future performance of those assets. So it's sort of, it's one of the benefits of being here in Houston is there's all these people that are relevant (laughs) for these things. Just you you meet them at a a cocktail hour, I'm going to a happy hour by an oil services company. Uh, sorry, go ahead. So you get like, uh, how do you say, an edge because you actually do the due diligence for these companies. And I mean, from an outsider's perspective, I assume there is tons of value traps here where you don't understand why something is cheap and so on. But doing what you do, it's really, really, really requiring you to fully understand in the minute details of what it is you're buying when you buy a stock like this shale oil company? Yeah, I mean, so the sector we're in, um, we launched Bison in May of 2015, and the small cap energy index, so S&P 600 energy, there's a ticker PSCE, it's down close to 60% since we launched in 2015. And you know, this isn't a solicitation or whatever, but we're up over 100% net of all fees and everything in that same time. So. We'll, we'll look crazy sometimes and we'll be wrong sometimes, but doing this degree of due diligence and this sort of careful underwriting of companies over time has allowed for compounded outperformance. And then the exciting thing to me, um, and again, this is more of a sector thing, but if, if we can do that in a downturn, what happens when you know eventually I think small cap oil and gas stocks will outperform? like in every other commodity cycle, what happens is that you need the small companies to do well enough that it attracts capital for them to go explore, to be able to find enough oil to then have an oversupply. If you never get an oversupply, you just have higher and higher prices forever. That's not how it works. 
in order to get the cycle to end, you need higher valuations for the companies that go and grow production and find new production and new reserves of whatever the commodity is, whatever the thing is in any sort of cyclical. So almost by definition, you need the small caps to massively outperform. You need them to get back to their all-time highs and then probably make new all-time highs. So that, that sector, and again, it's not perfect. Some companies went bankrupt in that index and whatever, but still, I would expect that PSCE to be up since inception substantially by the time this cycle ends. So I think there's really a lot of room. But the reason to mention that is on something like Vital, it's not comfortable. It's not, it's not safe from the perspective of buybacks and dividends and the things that are popular right now. But it's safe relative to transaction value. It's safe relative to a reasonable business plan that's adding value. And it's safe because you know why it's cheap. You can see all the things people don't like about it. And then you see the path that they're carefully taking, sort of unpopular, that's allowing them to re-rate. And then their peers trade at huge premiums. Um, and there's a potential uplift where they get a little bigger and do a few more creative deals. There is a, a path for them without a buyout, without anything, just in the public market to trade closer to their peers, which would be, you know, stocks as we're talking around $54 a share. You know, if they traded in line with their peers, it could be well over $100 a share and literally nothing would need to change. Going forward then uh, to Josh's number one stock out of your top three, which one is it? So <laughs> I think people will dislike this one the most, which again, I sort of, I like these things. It's, it's uncomfortable when, the, when, they're, when they're popular and people are happy with them. So Journey Energy. So it's a low decline producer of oil and gas in Canada. That's also acquisitive. I like these companies that go and do acquisitions that increase their net asset value per share while also picking up sort of free upside. And then Journey um, I was their largest shareholder uh, when they were a smaller company, and I helped get them to start doing uh, natural gas power plants. And Alberta, the province that they're located in, is undersupplied uh, from a power perspective with reliable power. They've been building a lot of solar and wind, but you know, similar to uh, Scandinavia, there there are a number of months where it's uh, not so reliable to uh, get to see the sun, unfortunately. Um, and uh, you know, wind also is very intermittent by its nature. And so there's a lot of room for um, natural gas power generation, especially intermittent power generation, to run and to both supply the grid to help solve a real problem, but also to earn excess returns especially relative to the low natural gas price that we've seen in Alberta. So this one trades also under three times cash flow. Um, it trades at a large discount to its proved developed producing reserve value. And the power projects have mostly been delayed. They built one small one, which is great. And it's already gotten payback, even though it's only been online for a few years, which again is unusual for a utility style asset. These things normally take five or seven or 10 years to pay back. The idea is that they're around for a long time. This one, it got paid back. I think it got paid out in two and a half years, something like that. So um, they've been delayed on their next two projects, but one of them they announced is um, is under construction and is supposed to come on in October. And then the other one they're expecting in January of next year. I think as those turn on, the capital they were spending looked like it was sort of stuck or non-productive because it didn't lead to oil production growing, um, but it will lead to cash flow from natural gas power um, generation. And I don't think they're getting any value for that business. They're discounted relative to their oil and gas production and their existing reserves. And then they're getting, you get essentially their power generation for free. And over time, as they build more of these, you could actually see the equity just being supported by those power generators and basically getting this 12,000, 13,000 barrels a day of oil and gas production for free in a company that from a US dollar perspective is under $200 million in uh, total, total value. And what is your exit strategy? Is it to get payback in uh, dividends or do you hope for uh, them being bought out or 
uh, where will you see what sort of trigger is there for the price? Uh, for Journey, I think their power generation is sort of its own catalyst where as they get that online and prove out this portion of their business, maybe they sell that. Uh, one of their competitors sold an inferior asset to this um, for around $100 million last year. And so if they can sell that asset for $200 million, that would justify their whole market cap. And again, you know, one, their stock price would go up, but then they could pay off debt, buy back shares, pay a large dividend. Um, but I think, I think about things less... Once a stock is in the public market, it doesn't necessarily need... Um, it doesn't necessarily need to buy back shares even, or even pay a dividend. Sometimes you need to because you've really misbehaved. But um, a, a miscellaneous stock, by growing its net asset value per share, the share price can appreciate far more than its peers, especially peers that get distracted and end up you know, diverting capital. For example, with Journey, Journey's return on investment, their incremental return on investment has been close to 40% a year for the last five years. And so imagine if they had taken that capital and paid a 5% dividend with it instead of reinvesting at a roughly 40%. And that, that might actually be low. Let's see what happens when with their cash flow when their power generation turns on. Um, one other thing I'll point out is you, you, you may have noticed in each of these companies that I mentioned, we found additional assets besides just yeah. the oil and gas production or additional attributes of the investment thesis that aren't just, hey, this thing is cheap on cash flow reserves, um, or hey, this thing is growing five or 10% and that's it. I think it's really helpful to find these sorts of extra assets that you don't think the market's paying for, or in Synovus's case, they're actually discounted for, um, because it helps provide, uh, you know, Seth Klarman wrote this book, Margin of Safety, to, which is a great book and worth, worth reading and an important concept. I think, I think you want to find those sorts of margin of safety situations because that way, you know, if oil prices do poorly, if natural gas prices do poorly, you know, Synovus can make a lot of money on their refining. Journey can make a lot of money on their power generation. And frankly, in a low price environment, Vital might still get bought out at a premium to where they're trading. So you can sort of heads I win, tails I don't lose too much. Um, and that's the sort of thing I look for uh, in finding a portfolio company. And then if that situation uh, changes or disappears, then that's where I would sell and redeploy capital. Your fund is up like 100% since, what was it, 2015? While yeah. the same index in like uh, S&P 500, 600, S&P, what, what was it called? S&P? S&P 600 Energy Index. It's like the small cap. Yeah. It's, it's the small cap index, like the Russell 2000 sort of similar idea, but that's the energy component of that. And that's been down 60% on the same time. So basically, in many cases, you can invest in an ETF that just like follows the index and you'd be doing good. But in this sector, it could be detrimental if you choose something that just follows every small uh, oil and gas company. Uh, would you agree to that statement that it's really a stock picker's market? Yeah, I think one of the things we found, we, we talked to all the different um Ivy League and other endowments and foundations when we were launching Bison, and actually one invested, and they were invested for a number of years, which was wonderful. Um, but their competitors, they had this view, um, you know, and it was uh, perpetuated by uh, David Swenson, at, or initiated uh, by David Swenson at Yale, and then sort of adopted more broadly, that you want to invest in low-cost index funds um, on the public side, and then you want to allocate to private equity because the belief was that private equity would materially outperform yeah, have unconventional success on the bookshelf from, from David Swensen. He talked about that. That's more about sort of personal investing rather than um, uh, endowments, but same idea. So um, what our argument was is that public equity money was leaving the oil and gas space aggressively in 2015, and it hasn't come back. Uh, the energy S&P component, I think it's 4% of the S&P 500 index in the U.S. versus it's close to 9% of the earnings for the S&P 500 index. That's of the largest companies 
On the small side, it's even more extreme. And so you would expect, I mean, I went to the University of Chicago, I studied economics, I got to meet all the pharma French folks. And even in those efficient market models, there's always an allowance for outperformance in the smallest companies, in the least liquid areas of the market, in the places with sort of the most opportunity for price discovery, they actually make allowance for outperformance in those aspects of the market. So it actually shouldn't be so surprising that one could do well. Again, it's not easy and it's very stressful and there's periods of underperformance and so on. But um, yeah, I think, I know it's sort of a long answer, but it's a really, the, the everyone everyone is going one way, which is towards passive investments. And it's just so, I know it sounds radical, but there are so many great opportunities on the active investment side, whether it's personal or whether it's in a fund. Um, and I think the best opportunities are in the spaces that are the most uncomfortable, similar to these stocks where they're not, it's like, <laughs> it's almost awkward to talk about them. They're so sort of unpopular and unloved and have none of the attributes that people are looking for. Um, and yet, you know, they, there are good fundamental reasons for them to potentially outperform over time. But that, uh, that may not be too bad to, I mean, if you're going to be a stock picker, you don't want to be in the crowded market. I mean, what sort of edge can you have in NVIDIA, which has a million eyes on it? Uh, but I'm going to actually switch topic for a short while because we're running out of time and I want to have some more of the viewers' questions. Uh, we have another question that says, will humanity ever lose its dependency on oil? Will we reach that day? Um, potentially. The, the challenge is that a lot of oil is used for non-energy um, uses. So there's a lot of um, plastics. There's a lot of uh, you know various things like the plastic buttons on my shirt um, are made uh, from from oil uh, or other hydrocarbons. And so I think I think the idea of getting rid of oil is really complicated. And then I saw a headline today actually. Apparently VW is noticing that. Uh, petrol vehicle sales are up and electric vehicle sales are down. So, um, and again, maybe that's a temporary phenomenon, uh, but it's certainly not what people expect. So maybe at some point in the distant future, if we figure out a way to make synthetic, let's say plastics or whatever, not from oil and gas and other hydrocarbons. Um, but I think, I think it's in the very distant future. And I think I think both from a policy perspective and from an investment perspective, the the concept of oil peaking right now has been very dangerous and very value destructive. It hasn't happened. It's not happening. And oil demand continues despite all of the rhetoric. It continues to grow by about a million and a half to two million barrels a day. And even the the agencies that were estimating US or sorry, global oil demand would grow by, I think it was 1.3 or 1.4 million barrels a day for this year, have started to revise their estimates up. And we're on track, it looks like it was weird. Uh, IEA and EIA had estimates that were low. And then OPEC had an estimate that was, I think, 2.4 million barrels a day. I think OPEC was probably too high, but it, they're probably closer to being right. And again, when you think about it, okay, why does 2024 matter? Well, it's this year. And then next year is more likely to be like this year than it is to be like some imaginary future where we fly on hydrogen individual, you know, Jetson style uh, vehicles. Um, so you know, I think it's helpful to calibrate, not just by doing the math, but also looking at what's happening right now. We have another question from Torbjörn. He asks, when will the oil price reach $120? And I'm guessing it's the WTI. Yeah, I mean, no one knows. And the reality is it sells you know, newspapers and gets people to watch TV, but no, no one knows. I, I do think oil prices will reach all-time highs because it's just like every other commodity and just like every other cycle. It's just the nature of these things. And then there's been a lot of inflation. So I think there's a little bit of debate over will oil reach all-time highs on an inflation-adjusted basis or just on a nominal basis. But either way, it will happen. I think it's just hard to tell because there's too much 
there are too many variables. And you know, if it's that hard to figure out what the cash flow of a particular business is going to be in a particular year, imagine trying to accurately forecast all of the different supply and demand elements of a global commodity with dozens of countries producing it and numerous factors affecting demand positively and negatively at any given moment, forget any, any given year. It's a very, very complicated thing. People, I think, are very hesitant to give this answer, which is no one knows, and I certainly don't know, but I think it's just important. You got to know what you can know and know what you can't, and I don't think anyone knows when oil will get over 120. Well, it's uh, interesting because uh, my relatives are from uh, Kurdistan in north of Iraq, and basically the whole economy is based on oil. So uh, for them, high oil price means everyone will get a salary. Low oil price means tougher times. And they always say, no one actually knows if we're going to get salary because no one understands this. So yeah, it's volatile as anything. Josh, we've actually run out of time and I'm so happy you had the time to speak to us. Uh, hope that you'll visit Sweden as well. We have, I think, some oil companies, although most of them have their headquarters in Canada. With all that, this show is over for this time. We'll be uh, back next week. And thank you very much, Josh, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun.